This podcast is proud to be part of the Blueberry Network. That's blueberry with no ease dot com. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of Entrepreneur on Fire, and you're listening to Transpersonal Radio with Angela Lynn Gibson. Remember, your thoughts upload your reality. Think wisely and always prepare to ignite. Welcome. Welcome to Transpersonal Radio. Transpersonalradio.com. Real talk for real life. Inspiring podcasts. Exploring personal empowerment. empowerment. And transformation. Through parapsychology, spirituality, and how your thoughts upload. upload your reality. And now your host, Angela. Angela L. Gibson. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash transpersonal radio. Over 150,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Hello, Transpersonal Radio listeners. How would you like to increase your capacity to give and receive love? Would you like to have more fulfilling relationships? Would you like to feel more joy in your life? Are you ready to own or take back your power? Today's guest, Dr. Ida Green, is known as the Sage of Self-Love. Dr. Ida has a Master's in Counseling and has her DD and PhD in Theology. She is a motivational speaker licensed marriage, family, and child therapist, ordained minister, registered nurse, and intuitive self-love coach. She is also a Reiki energy balancing practitioner, EFT trainer, NLP practitioner, certified hypnotherapist, and the author of 22 books. One of Dr. Ida's proudest achievements is being the founder for the Center of Self-Esteem, whose mission is to end violence and abuse of children and women. Dr. Ida's areas of expertise include self-empowerment, negotiation skills, stress management, managing life changes, domestic violence, as well as etiquette and anger management for children and adults. She provides self-love coaching for entrepreneurs and small business owners on strategies to grow yourself so your inner and outer self is congruent. She also helps you master your personal power. Dr. Ida Green has been providing these powerful and insightful skills to clients for over 30 years. As a self-love coach, Dr. Ida provides guidance on self-acceptance, self-confidence, and ways to manage your personal power on your journey to self-love. Dr. Ida's goal is to help you master your personal power to be your best in your personal and professional life. She's going to share some insights with us today about how to get out of our way to reach our own personal and professional goals. Dr. Ida's mission is to heal the planet and create a more loving world by helping people deeply love themselves. She is here for you as a transformational world leader on your journey to self-love and is healing the planet one individual at a time. Dr. Ida, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Angie. Thank you so much for having me on this show. I am so delighted to have you, Dr. Ida. Now, I have met Dr. Ida in person a few times, Transpersonal Radio listeners, and I have to tell you, Dr. Ida just glows with love. She truly walks her talk, and she is someone who has so much great insight on how we can heal ourselves and heal our communities and heal the planet. Dr. Ida, you help people be more congruent on the inside to be more powerful on the outside. I love how that sounds. Can you walk us through what that means and how you help people become more congruent? Absolutely. Well, the one thing that I have to help everyone to realize that we can all improve, we can all get better. And even if you think you have some self-love, we can deepen that. Every part of ourselves, can we can improve and get better. So what I try to do is first to get you into the awareness that be open to grow and to involve. And once we look at that, then we have to look at what areas in your life that there's an imbalance. Mm-hmm. And usually there's the emotional, there's the mental, there's the spiritual, and also there's the personality. So we look at 
all of those areas and see where you're out of alignment. Mm-hmm. And we work on the area where you where you have the most um, de- where the, the most deficiency. And what I'm finding though is that the self esteem, the self worth, the self appreciation, the self confidence seem like the basic foundation where people uh, have to grow and evolve. Once they get that down, then we have to look at where is the love. How do we get the love out of the person? And really one of the biggest things, and just getting them to really receive love. Many people, including myself, had trouble receiving love. I was always a giver mm-hmm. and giving to people and giving. And I was an overgiver, but I was not allowing people to give to me. And because of my, I grew up with the thing of uh, really not asking for help and yes. doing it on your own mm-hmm. and being on your own. So I did not allow myself to get help or to ask for help. So I try to invite people to be vulnerable and ask, allow people to give them, allow them to ask for help. And once we start doing that, just getting them to realize that they are not a planet and, you know, by themselves Mm -hmm. and being open to receive and open to uh, let people help them. That's the first step is being willing and open to help how that people help you. Once we do that, we, we can go through some steps, and I have several processes that I do with, with clients in my, my live workshops and also in my coaching uh, by phone to help them to shift those blocks. And I ask a series of questions that I ask them, and I got them through a process to help us to peel off the layers of the, of the ego and the personality layer by layer because there's so many layers that partly because of the thoughts we Absolutely. think, the environment that we're around, the people that we're part of, and there's so many, our culture itself just mm-hmm. lends us to being um, not really strong in ourself and our power and really owning our power. So we all, all of us have been traumatized and we all have been abused in some way, either emotional, verbal, physical, but we all have been abused, even sometimes spiritual abuse. Mm-hmm. And there's just so much healing and peeling off the layers that we all have to do. And I, part of my process is help them to recognize that this problem, help us to take some steps to uh, guide us through that process, and then help them to the other side of really growing that self. Wow, there's a lot of great stuff in there, Dr. Ida. You know, one of the things you said that, that is so important is this the concept of being able to receive. I know so many people, and especially women, who are in that mode of give, 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 overgive. And and then a lot of women, I was one of them who was so strong in the masculine power of I have to do for myself. I can't be vulnerable. I can't trust anyone, rely on anyone. I've got to do it all myself, be everything to everyone. And we, as we know, that leads to a major crash. That's, that's not sustainable on any level. What do you think is, uh, uh, something that you could say to someone who's in that mode right now, who's having trouble trusting or having trouble being vulnerable to get to that place where they can even begin to receive? The first thing I would say is really learning to trust the self. And when I, because I had that problem myself, is uh, letting my guard down, letting people into my personal space. And so I had to let myself know that it was safe, that no one was going to hurt me emotionally, and people would only go as far as I would let them Mm -hmm. go. If I went too far and gave them too much permission, then I could always take back my power. So if you overstep and we can't be afraid of getting hurt or people will hurt us. That's going to happen just by being a human being. We're going to have these bumps in the road because life is a series of peaks and valleys. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of having coaching and consultation and because we all need that help. So I would say to someone, trust your intuition, be open to to, uh, accept help, get the help and know that, um, Nothing is final, and if you have a dip, you're going to bounce right up. Whatever goes down comes up again. Nice. I love it. And I love what you said as well about uh, what I say is is, is uh, the saying, no one is an island unto him or herself, and you said no one is a planet on their own. And you're right. Even if you try to isolate yourself, as as humans, 
humans are hardwired to be part of a community, to connect, to want to have the company of other people, unless they are suffering from some sort of of uh, physical, mental illness where they are isolated or by the very uh, act of being isolated can develop physical and mental uh, problems. So when you're talking about no one is an island or planet unto himself or herself, talk about being able to to connect within a community, within your family, within your group of friends, within your sphere. If you're not really making those connections, how can people connect better? Well, one thing they have to do is you, if, you, if you're really an loner and you're not accustomed to that, I would uh, invite them to go to a social gathering and just be there and look and be a part of that and not interact and not say anything and gradually speak up and maybe ask somebody for a glass of water or for a cookie or a tea just to start asking mm-hmm. and get themselves in the game. And one way to get yourself is in the game and just, you know, just say, I, I, hi, I don't, I don't know your name. I just want to let you know who I am or what is just asking them what is their name with me a good start mm-hmm. you know and I'm new here and I don't know anyone and I just want to introduce myself to you. just start really small and just you know the greatest thing that you can do is just ask people what is their name and what they do that's a good icebreaker mm-hmm. what do you do what's your name and let tell them your name and pretty soon the conversation will kind of start and you're, they'll tell you, share a little bit more about you and you'll share a little bit more about them. And feel free to withhold, you know, what you want to withhold. And you don't have to tell all, but you can at least open the door. And one of the biggest ways to let people in your life is to smile and be friendly and have um, have a willingness to hear and learn about the other person because everyone wants to be heard. And mm-hmm. we just let them talk. They're going to feel that we are very smart and that we, we know a lot. <laughs> we just really allow them to talk. So if you meet someone who's a extroverted person, you're an uh, introvert, let them talk and they're going to they're gonna just love you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I love that. And, and, you know, that is a great tool to use, uh, especially for people who have social anxiety. Uh, you know, even if you're uncomfortable really attempt to make that first step. And you're right. One of the best ways of connecting with someone is to ask them questions about themselves and that can start conversations. So, so I love that. Let's talk a little bit about a big one, which is self-sabotaging behaviors. Now I know I've been guilty of this in the past as well. Why do people sabotage themselves and how can we change this behavior? Well, I think we, we, we're not always thinking and most of us, including myself, have negative thoughts, and we have to find a way to keep our thoughts on the positive um, plane because if we keep these thoughts on a negative thought, we're going to end up doing some self-defeating behaviors and action. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes we have to take a look and see what can we do to keep our thoughts positive because our thoughts are a reflection of us, our behaviors are a reflection of us. So we have to look to see what can we do to uplift ourselves. And once we uplift ourselves, other people automatically lift it up with our energy, our empowered energy. And one way we can do that is to um, start thinking positive, acting positive, and acting encouraging so that we can encourage others. I think if we can just encourage ourselves in the process of encouraging ourselves, we're going to, someone else is going to be lifted up by just being around us. Because we really, we don't realize, well, we are not islands and we are energy fields and energy comes from us and from our thoughts and from our inner being. And just um, being around someone can mm-hmm. make a difference. I went to a workshop yesterday and someone said, I like your energy, and I saw you from the other room, and I wanted to come and meet you, and I found people want to come sit next to me mm-hmm. just to be in that energy field. And I didn't say anything to them at all, but apparently my positive thoughts and my positive vibration invited, wanted to have people come and sit next to me. I thought that was mm-hmm. really kind of cool. And then yes. one guy said, you have a really, very uh, strong energy field and a positive personality. And I, I, you know, but it's because I try to keep my thoughts positive, and keep, uh, well, I mostly keep my thoughts positive, and it's positive thoughts 
create positive energy, and positive energy makes you a beacon of light where people are attracted to you. Mm-hmm. Yes, that is very, very true. And I've experienced that myself as well when, you know, I have days where I'm kind of just not on my game and, and I don't have a lot of interaction with people. And it's because I'm kind of putting out that vibration or that energy as opposed to when I'm really on my game, I'm feeling good, I want to be where I am and and I'm just you know, that like you just described, my, I can tell that my, my aura is strong, my energy is strong, my vibration is high, my frequency is, is in tune, and, and, and I am like a magnet. People want to be around me. They want to talk to me. They want to interact. And so it's really fascinating watching how, you know, it's, it's, it's everything about how you present yourself, your body language, you, how you hold yourself, your tone, and your energy field. And people are brought, drawn into that. And Sometimes, even if we are on a down day, if we just keep our thoughts positive and, and we are, you know, have a nice tone of voice and a nice demeanor and we're not angry, I think anger is one of the biggest things that takes away from our light and our joy mm-hmm. and our love. So if we can keep our irritation and frustration and anger and resentment to a, a minimum and try to delete them completely, that will make us be a, a beacon, uh, a beacon, brighter beacon of light. We will shine more bright than when around other people. I love that. I love that. Let's talk about self-esteem. Now, this is a big one because this is something that can be damaged from early childhood or the other extreme where you have such a high self-esteem, you become narcissistic, so you still can't really connect with people. But we're going to talk a little bit more about how self-esteem, when it's damaged, how you don't really love yourself, you don't really care for yourself or think that you're worthy of anything. Now, you talk, Dr. Ida, about changing low self-worth into what you call self-deserving and self-acceptance. What are some steps people can take today to start improving their own self-acceptance? Well, the one thing that I recommend that people do is to, first of all, have some have some affirmation, write out the affirmation, put them on the table. And before that, I really suggest that people, when they wake up in the morning time and they look in the mirror and they're washing their face, look in the mirror and greet yourself into the world each day because we have to invite ourselves, our inner self and our high self and our divine self into the world and have become a player each day. Every day we wake up, we have to, bring our energy up and be willing to be in the plane of the living. Some people go through the whole day and they just kind of go blah, but we have to greet that day and with a smile, looking in the mirror and smiling at the person you see in the mirror and just saying, I like you, you know, and pretty soon you get to the place you like that person, but just really saying something uh, that you like about the person. And the other thing is how you treat your body. We have to really take time to, you know, even men, we need to put lotion on our body. We need to stroke our face in a gentle way. Uh, but we have to take time without the rushing to, you know, fix ourselves up, put our clothes on, uh, wa- make sure that our body is clean and there's no odor and our teeth are brushed and our hair is brushed. We just have to really do a lot of self care and we don't always take the time to really care for ourselves and mm-hmm. make ourselves uh, a positive product that people want to be around. I mean, you just don't want, they even polish the apples in the grocery store. So we need to polish ourselves up and make <laughs> our stuff look good so That's that we true. can be appealing and attractive so that mm-hmm. people want to be around us, which means we have to put on deodorant, you know, we don't have to put on a perfume, but clean ourselves, brush our teeth. Uh, polish our shoes, we just clean our nails. There's so many things that we can do to make ourselves feel good that we don't do. Brushing your hair, you know, and putting a little makeup on. It, all of this stuff is part of self-care, but the most important one is saying something positive to yourself every day. And what I like to say to myself is that I like you and I love you and I appreciate you. Oh, that's that's wonderful. And I I like that because you just address both spiritual hygiene and regular hygiene and both are so important. And I agree with you. Those are the very foundations of self-esteem and just practicing that starting to make that a daily practice can change and improve and heal a damaged self-esteem. 
And one other tip, in terms of self-confidence, I liked it, and I had to catch myself. I had to put my shoulders back because I have a tendency sometimes to slouch my shoulders forward. But people who are self-confident have the shoulders back and their head erect, so watch for how you're standing and make sure as often as you can to put your shoulders back so that you can look like a confident person, that you can look like someone who's heading someplace and that you're about something and people want to be around someone who, because when your shoulders are back, it shows that you have charisma. It shows that you have a uh, character, that you are someone who's going someplace and people are attracted to people who are forward moving and who are mm-hmm. po- forward thinkers. I agree. Absolutely. Now, Dr. Ida, I was just on a panel in Los Angeles this last weekend where we were discussing how to deal with difficult people and being in a reality that has seemingly gone a little mad sometimes. You know, we're looking at our political landscape right now. We're looking at the economy. We're looking at massive debt. We're looking at all these things going on in the world right now and and how people interact with one another. And, and there seems to be lately a heightened level of frustration and anger and all this kind of stuff going on. So one of the things you also do is you help people resolve conflict and develop a strategic plan to help them successfully achieve goals and objectives and move them forward in life. So what advice do you have for dealing with difficult people or resolving conflict? Well, one of the things that I'm constantly having to do is to help people to put themselves in the place of the other person. And I do a lot of couples uh, coaching lately, and um, I find the couples are looking at the faults of the other one, you know, and I kind of shine a light. You know, I let them talk about the faults, but then I want them to shine a light on what the other person is doing that's good and that's positive and not focus on the negative. I find that couples and even individuals focus on the faults and what person's doing wrong and they complain and they criticize. Mm-hmm. But you, you, once you, that doesn't build people up. So we have to keep our, our criticism and our complaints to ourselves because when we minimize that, at, the more we lift people up, we're going to have a more positive society. And everyone needs to be lifted up. Even if they, we think they're at the top, even people at the top uh, get the most darts and more criticism thrown at them when we all need to be encouraged. We all need to have feel that we're make doing a good job, that we're making a difference in the world. And when we lift someone else up, we get lifted up in the process. So I really practice the three C's is about criticism, complaining and condemning. Mm, I love that. I love that. And you know, it's interesting because now I've I've been around the corporate world and I've been around law enforcement and I've been around the medical field and I've been around light workers in on the psychic circuit and working the the healing expos and the healing fairs and and it's surprising to me sometimes how it seems like no matter where you are people are people and I've run into even working sometimes some of the expos or the healing fairs where there's conflict or there's competition and and I really find that difficult to deal with because first of all these are people who are supposed to be enlightened right they're light workers and and also i i've always come from a space of there doesn't need to be this competition what you just said dr ida is so true if i lift you up you lift me up where why can we not just create win-win situations i think sometimes uh people jump to conclusion because I was at a holistic uh, fair where one lady uh, asked the boy to help her out and he was the son of the other lady and this lady did not know he was her son and she got very defensive and wanted to argue and fight with her and I just kind of intervened and got the two people talking and I resolved the conflict because what I am, I'm certainly I'm uh, a true love connector and a self-love coach. And I, whenever I see conflict, I interject love. So I just kind of went in and started talking about, I changed the conversation. And once I changed the conversation and got them on a different topic, then they were to discuss later. And that we found out later that the one lady felt that she was telling her son what to do and the other one 
uh, was wondering why the lady was angry, but she didn't even know that that was her son. Mm. And someone had told her that this man was helping out, was the one to go to for help. So sometimes it's assuming that people know Mm -hmm. when they don't know and um, getting upset. And we can assume that people know. I think that's where we start problems is assuming that they should know or they have the answer or they're doing it deliberately. People, some, most time, people don't really know. People in their own little world, and they really, since we don't ask a lot of questions, we don't always know what people are thinking, and people don't always tell people what they're thinking. Yeah. So one person is another domain, and, and we're in two separate worlds, unless we start talking and asking questions. So I suggest people ask more questions, because the more we ask questions, the more information we get, more things out in the open, and less there is to hide or to, to assume that, something is one way when it's a different way. I love that. I love that. Yes. Great advice. Let's talk about something that comes up quite a bit. I've had several clients ask me about this and this is a good one. And it revolves around this constantly struggling. So what advice do you have for someone who seems like no matter what, they're constantly struggling. They never seem to get ahead. Nothing seems to work out. Or sometimes things even seem to get worse. They, they're just stuck in this pattern of wanting to have something better. And they're trying, you know, they're working really hard, but it just, nothing seems to work. So what do you think's going on there? I have been in that place myself. And what has happened is that I start feeling sorry for myself and start thinking of poor me. I, isolate myself from other people. I don't talk about what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking. No one knows what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. And I started kind of feeding on myself and called entropy where you start destroying yourself because you're not really sure and you're not talking and all that negative toxic energy goes inside. Plus, we all think negative thoughts of every day and if we're thinking all these negative thoughts and there's no place to go outside they go inside and everything goes inside and it just keeps feeding on itself and we get into a down downward spiral and we have to really watch the thoughts that we think because we are rarely thinking positive thoughts most of the day we're thinking negative thoughts about ourselves and about other people so we have to watch that and Watch the tendency to feel sorry for yourself and think that everyone is, is doing better than you. Everyone has their struggles. Mm-hmm. And life is, uh, I mean, the struggles and the challenges are not, t- God doesn't have favors. We all go through these challenges. And just know that because you're going through your challenges, I need, we, we need to share those challenges that we're going through with someone else so they can lift us up. But when we keep ourselves as an island and we don't let people know what we're going through, then they can't lift us up and they can't support us and they can't help us. So I suggest sharing with people what you're talking about. And then once you share, don't dwell on it. Go, you know, release it. Once you talk about it, release it. Let it go and start looking looking for something positive and hopeful and expect a change because... If we really expect something to change, things will change. But we keep expecting things are never going to change. They won't change. So we have to have a an attitude of positive expect, expectancy and knowing that our life will get better rather than get worse. Mm-hmm. So again, it goes into the whole idea of, of thoughts creating reality because what we think and what we speak mm-hmm. is, is what defines our actions and then what defines everything around us and and it it affects ourselves and the people we're interacting with. So of course we're going to create these situations to fulfill whatever it is we're thinking and and speaking. There's so much power in our thoughts. I am, I'm, I've known that forever. And when I find myself in a rut, I try to talk to someone, I find someone who is a little bit more upbeat so they can bring me out of my little rut and bring me back up to the ladder. So when you're in a rut, and you, especially when you, what I try to do when people um, come to me about a complaint, I always give them a, dip, a positive perspective. That I never let them leave me with the complaint. I always, and that's what one lady says, I like about you because when I come to you with a complaint, you always have something positive. You turn it around and make it mm-hmm. something positive. You don't let me dwell in my stew and keep standing in that place. Well, I don't want them to, 
lead the way I found them. I want to change their thought pattern and give them another perspective of what's going on rather than agree mm-hmm. with them. You know, if I agree with them and they agree with them, they're going to stay in that in that rut. So I try to give them a different perspective on what the problem is so they can see another view of it and you say, we don't want you to look at this. It's says another way to look at it rather than just your view. Very nice. Very, very great advice. What are some tips you can give in creating a strategic action plan for achieving goals? And, you know, people always do these New Year's resolutions or they have these, you know, these plans or these goals, but then it seems procrastination kicks in or they get busy doing other things or they have so many things going on, their energy is scattered. So how can people get focused? How can people get sort of, you know, get some steps in place to actually move forward? Well, the one thing that I have done for myself for the past 30 years, and I found it to, to really be successful, is I write down the night before I go to bed the things I have to do the next day. If it's not written down, it doesn't <laughs> get done. I just have to write it down on paper and cross it off every time it gets done. And I, you don't have more than 10 things on your list. It's better to keep at least five things on that list and get those done because you're going to feel successful. Mm-hmm. You have 10 or more, that's too many things that to accomplish. And then the things that, let's say you have six or seven things on your list, then they roll up to the next day if you don't accomplish. Like today I wanted to go to the dentist. Well, I, my car had priorities. I went to the car and I called the dentist. Well, I, you know, my, I, wasn't, I wasn't in pain, so I'm going to go there tomorrow. So you kind of switch things around as they, as they show up. And, you know, we've got to do, have some priority. In term, I put things in terms of A, B, C, D, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. But put a star by In fact, the things that are really important, I put two stars mm-hmm. by them. And three stars by the ones that are very important and one star by the ones. And the ones that I, you know, just can do, I just don't have a check mark about them. But we have to have a plan. And also... The other thing is we have to look at those goals every 30 days. Uh, and I used to have, I don't do it anymore, but I used to have a five-year goal and a three-year goal and a one-year goal. Now I just keep them to three months, six months, and one year because I used to get mm-hmm. overwhelmed with all that five-year and three-year thing. Although when you're working your business, they do want you to do some projection. But you can have that as a part of your business plan. But allow, don't allow yourself to get overwhelmed with that and think that you've got to accomplish this mm-hmm. today. You know, we can always, we have tomorrow, I, but I am into a do it now. So I am a do it now person. If I have a piece of paper in my hand, I will do it right now, then put it off. If I put it off, it won't get done. So we do have to be a person of action and act now rather than later. Just become a, if you do nothing else, become a do it now person, I guarantee you'll be successful in life. Because that's the practice I've done all my life is do it now. I don't put it off. I just do it right in the moment because I'll forget and it never gets done. (laughs) Yes, you and me both, Dr. Ida. And I love what you said about breaking these things down into having no more than five items on your list for the day that that absolutely must be done. And if there are things that you're ordering in order of importance, if they bleed over past five, then move that to another day. And I think that's really wise advice because one of the things that I see over and over again, I'm guilty of myself, is having 20, 30 items on a list and then getting overwhelmed and shutting down and not doing any of them. Yeah, that makes me go to sleep. When I've done too many things, <laughs> my mind just shuts down and says, I can't handle this. It's too much yep. stuff. And, exactly. and I, get, I get sleepy. I actually get sleepy and tired. I, and I just have to take me a nap. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I like that. That's going to be number one on my list, take a nap. So, and, I do, and I believe in naps. So that's one thing that I believe in taking. Some people can't, but try to take a cat nap. Even if it's a five minutes, the brain needs a break. Mm-hmm. Just go to the bathroom, go get some water, go outside, change your scenery, do something, pick up a pencil, uh, get some water, just do something to change your scenery, scenery to get more oxygen going to the brain. I agree. Absolutely. Albert Einstein also, he was a huge proponent of taking catnaps. And mm, I love catnaps. I mean, to yes. me, it's better than a meal. Absolutely. <laughs> I love my catnaps. Yes. So let's talk about another big one. 
that people are experiencing, especially it seems more and more today, and that is worry, fear, and anxiety. And those emotions keep people really stuck and trapped. So what are some tools people can use to help them when they're stuck in this fear and worry cycle? Yeah. My mother had a PhD in worry, and so I had a real big problem with worry and what I had, and and with fear. So what I had to do, in fact, I was just young. I was like maybe 15. I was afraid to leave from Florida to go to Chicago to go to nursing school. So, and I broke out in a rest. I just Mm -hmm. wrote down all the things that could possibly, all the things that was going on, what could possibly happen, you know, what was the worst outcome. Mm -hmm. And then I looked at each one and then I worked with the worst outcome and that distressed myself but the other thing I learned was to take a lot of deep breath because I had a tendency to overreact and get over anxious and to I was an overthinker and a lot of people a lot of the stress come from overthinking and breathing fast and moving fast I had to slow myself down and I used to say God to slow me down and I learned to start breathing deeply practicing breathing deeply uh, You know, and also meditation is really, really powerful. Meditating in the morning for 20 minutes and meditating uh, 20 minutes in the evening. Uh, Taking a a short walk either around your house or around the block. We just have to get some oxygen in our lungs. But the one thing that's really important is realize that nothing ever is a matter of life and death. And if it is, you're either going to live or you're going to die. Yeah. And, you know, so you have a chance to... We, some people make mountains out of little tiny things, mm-hmm. and we over-exaggerate things. But I have to find myself taking a step back and giving myself a chance to revisit that again and realizing that it's a fear of what might happen. But I guarantee you that nothing will kill you in the moment. You know, if you have a heart attack, then you go to the hospital and they take care of you. But most of us don't have heart attacks. We just worry ourselves into a panic, and we get so stressed out that we it's hard to calm down. So I suggest taking deep breaths often, which I do, find a way to relax myself, and I love these cat naps, you know, and I love mm-hmm. some, giving myself a diversion, doing something. I'll just go into the bedroom and come back or to the bathroom or something. Just change my position, you know, just get up and stand up and wiggle around. Or, activity cures so many things, and we need to shake our body out and get all the stress out of our body. Mm-hmm. I used to jump up and down to mm-hmm. de-stress myself, you know. Now I'm not as high strung as I used to be, so now I can just change my position before I had to just do some jumping jacks or something get the energy moving. <laughs> I had too much estrogen. <laughs> now the estrogen has disappeared, you know. Yeah. I'm looking for the progesterone and the estrogen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, you know, let's talk about another really big one that, that you know, a, a lot, again, a lot of people struggle with, and it's another one that gets people really stuck. And oftentimes, this particular situation will have people stuck in re- unhealthy relationships. It has people stuck in unhealthy jobs. It has people stuck in just really bad situations, and that is guilt. Mm-hmm. What advice do you have for those who are afraid to make a choice because they have guilt around hurting someone or doing the wrong thing? Or how do you help people with healing guilt because of a decision they've already made? Well, you know, I try to let people know that no one is perfect. They're not perfect. Even the people that they feel that they have harmed, uh, they have hurt. Uh, I think some people uh, feel deeply and have deep feelings, and they uh, they took too much burden on themselves about, uh, I call it playing God, but they take so much burden on, but I'm responsible and it's my fault. Everyone is responsible for their own action, their behavior. We can't control the behavior of anyone. People do what they do, and sometimes they want us to blame us and make us take responsibility for their behavior. Mm -hmm. But they're in control of their thoughts, their actions, and their behavior. And we cannot fix another person's life or change them. I know because I try to do that with my 
the boy that I adopted. I, I've learned now that it's a full-time job just taking care of me. If I can just keep myself sane, I'm doing good. Mm-hmm. But I can't fix you. Uh, I can make suggestions. But if you don't follow my suggestion, then it's not my fault. But I used to feel bad when I would give people suggestions and they didn't follow my suggestion. But I give people choice, not freedom, to do as they choose and if they fail, it's their fault, not mine. So I'm not mm-hmm. responsible for other people's success or their failure. So I'm just not taking on too much responsibility of, of feeling responsible for people because when we feel responsible, then we take it on that burden. If they don't, if they fail, we think it's our fault, and it's not our fault. It's that they are choosing not to do whatever they what we suggested. They choose to fail, and we can't control. We can't decide how anyone want to live their life. That's true. That's very true. What tips do you have for us, Dr. Ida, to become better communicators? Well, the one thing I I suggest is that we smile more, that we um, give up, you know, criticize less, complain less, uh, have more compassionate communication and give others the benefit of the doubt. We're so harsh on people and thinking, mm-hmm. well, you know, we judge too much. We know we're the judge and the jury, and we we just don't give people a chance. And everyone needs a chance, a second chance. Even we need a second chance. So how we treat ourselves is how we treat others. So I suggest people be more compassionate with themselves, love themselves more. And as we are kind and compassionate with ourselves, that compassion will show in how we treat others. Perfect. Wonderful. Now, Dr. Ida, you are the author of 22 books. That's quite an achievement. I want to address about three of them this evening. So let's talk about one of them that I just am really excited about, which is understanding relationships and how to improve them. Tell us a little bit about the premise of that book and and some insight into that topic. Yeah, well, you know, I wrote that book because I find there's so many um, discord in relationships and people are not really relating each other and we're getting more distant. So the key focus that I try to get people on is making connection and first of all, connecting and, and I talk to them how to connect and what is the process connected. But we have to be willing to uh, give them our judgments. We have to be willing to want to reach out to another person and not feel that, you know, keep ourselves at a distance. But we also have to, what I call, impact the communication, where our communication is full of joy, love, and compassion. We smile when we when we are talking to the other person. We are waiting to hear what they have to say and really becoming a good listener. Some of the problems we have is because people – react and they think and they don't give the other person a chance to express themselves. When we give people a chance to express themselves, they're going to feel more loved by us and there's going to be less conflict. So listening is uh, doing more listening and talking less is very ideal in relationship with other people. Fantastic advice. And that's also fantastic advice for communicating better in general. I love that. Now, another book that you wrote that really caught my eye, I love this one, too, because as a society, oftentimes we are taught that we have to be paired up. And if we're not paired up, there's something wrong with us. Or if, uh, you know, if we're not in the perfect relationship, there's something wrong with us. You write a book that's called How to Be Alone Without Feeling Lonely. And I love that distinction. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. What I find is that because of this tendency to society tell us that we have to be paired up and it can make us feel guilty and make us feel I know when I was getting rid of divorce my husband I felt in fact first my first husband died and I thought I I was just couldn't handle being alone mm-hmm. and so from that I learned how to be alone you know first I had an animal and then once I got rid of all my animals and there was just me I was really afraid to be with myself Mm-hmm. Because I didn't know myself and didn't, I would say, like myself, but not deeply. So I had to really get to know my thoughts and my fears. And being alone, if your thoughts are very toxic and very negative, it's going to make you feel afraid. And most of us are afraid because 
we uh, think that we need something or someone to lift us up or to prop us up or to stand us up. And this fear of running from the self is really an area that we need to deal with because, you know, you what I discovered is that you're born by yourself and you die by yourself. And at some point in life, you have to learn how to be comfortable in your own skin, live with your own thoughts, which we're all afraid to live with our own thoughts. We have to face our fears, our anxieties, and face uh, what we're afraid of. Sometimes, we're, for myself, I was afraid of the unknown. What will happen? And I kept thinking, what will happen if this happen? I was just making things up, you know. What will happen if that? And all these fears just made me become uh, paralyzed. So mm-hmm. I had to really, I write down the things I'm afraid of, you know, write them down and look at those boogeymans or whatever these things are that just in your skeleton. And once you face them, they're not as kind of light on them. They're really not as bad as you think they are. And then I also encourage people to um, go out and, you know, and meet people. You know, I am great at going because I have no family in San Diego, but my attitude is that, Everyone is my family, so I go to meet my family. When I go to the grocery store, I go to meet my family. When I go to the post office, I go to meet my family. Everywhere I go, I go to meet my family. So if someone is nice to me, I appreciate that. But I'm nice to them before they're nice to me, and I smile mm-hmm. at everyone. And it works so much. Uh, it really is, works like miracles when you're um, reaching out to someone and just say, giving people, I give people compliments all the time, especially when I'm in the grocery line, and they love it. Mm, that's wonderful. That is sage advice. You know, it is it is a science and an art to learn how to be alone with yourself. Like you said, it's uh, oftentimes people will be in unhealthy relationships or jump relationship to relationship or put themselves in really strange situations just so they don't have to be alone with themselves and with their thoughts. And you're absolutely right. We're born alone, we die alone, and we need to really learn how to be alone in a healthy manner. And I think once you achieve that, you can be a better partner if you are in a partnership because... Mm -hmm. It, yeah, it, it helps even if you're in a partner because then you're not clinging and needy, clinging to the person, and no one likes to have one cling on them because you, when you go you're down, you pull them down with you, and they don't want you. They don't like to be around people clinging and needy and like a clam or a little clam. <laughs> you know, that just really right. doesn't feel good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of that, that's a that's a perfect segue into the next book I want to talk about that you authored, which is looking for love in all the wrong places. And, uh, boy, that's another big one for people. It is because most of us, and I would say uh, 90% of us, don't love ourselves. And we tell ourselves that we love ourselves. But if we loved ourselves, we certainly would not be beat up ourselves with all the negative thoughts we think about ourselves and negative Mm -hmm. things we say about ourselves. We would treat ourselves more kindly. We would not allow people to abuse us and take advantage of us. And when we found people are toxic around us, we'd put ourselves take ourselves away from toxic people. But we stay around toxic people and we allow people to abuse us and we stay there and say nothing and do nothing and they think we love it. So we get more of that. So we, uh, I think a desperation for not wanting to be alone is, you know, staying with something too long. We stay in terrible places, a tragic places too long and not have the courage to get away from things that are where we're being abused. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so in this book, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places, you address how to really, truly love yourself so you can have healthier interactions with others. Yeah, but I think one of the things that I suggest that most people do, you have to become friends with yourself. And I, I learned this early in life, you know, that, especially when I was living in Chicago and I, and I have to learn how to like myself and be friends with myself because when you're around people, people always will say critical things, they'll say negative things to you. And if no one is lifting you up, at least you have to be your best friend. My mother always said to me, it's a poor dog that doesn't wag his own tail, which means you got to be there for you. If no one else is there for you, then you have got to be there for you and stand up for for who you are. Don't just let people um, treat you any way. I mean, 
people treat us the way they treat us because we accept it and because we allow it. Mm-hmm. And I was in an abusive marriage. And um, I, you know, and I had to find a way to get out of that. But what I found myself saying to myself is that, you know, I love me and I don't hit me. If he hit me, he wouldn't love me. I thought, maybe he doesn't love me. I thought, oh, my God, I'm living with someone who don't love me. Then I had to find a way to take back my love and take back my heart. It took me some time and get myself out of that relationship because I didn't want to be any place where I was not loved. We should never be any place around anyone who doesn't love, respect, and appreciate us. It's better to be alone by yourself than to be with someone who hates you or doesn't like you, who disrespects you or going to hurt you. It's not worth it. You end up dead. Absolutely. And this brings up a really, really important point is how people can step into their own power, how they can find that sense of empowerment. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, that comes from building the self-esteem and some of the things we've been talking about this evening. But if you could give a piece of advice to someone about how they can step into their own power, what would that be? The one thing that I have to, I would suggest to people is realize when they've lost their power, most of us are not aware that we've lost our power. One way to, to recognize that is when people are criticizing us, complaining about us, finding fault with us and finding that everything we do is wrong. Then you've got to make a decision and a choice, we got to surround ourselves with people who are going to lift us up, who like us, who respect us, and who are going to say good things about us. And if that person is not, if that's not the right person, we have to have the courage to walk away from toxic, abusive environments that doesn't support us. And mm-hmm. sometimes if it's a work environment, you know, that takes time, but you can still look for another job. But I think also we have to, because I did a, a leadership job with the people, with the supervisor one time in the county, and I think communication is the key because I started having people have more empathic communication with other people, saying more positive things with other people, and looking at what they can do to lift themselves up. And as you lift yourself up, you're not going to want to be around people who are deadbeats and who are negative and complaining. I know one time I got rid of a boyfriend because he was think he was too negative. He was a nice guy, but he was thinking negative. And once I got in all this positive, uh, I don't want to be around negative people. So I just, I you know, was not attracted to him anymore just because he always thought negative, was always mm-hmm. criti- critical of me and criticized everybody. And I thought this is not, it's not lifting me up. So look for people that can lift you up where they, they can shine a light on your good points, and that's going to be the right environment to put yourself in. Absolutely. Very wise words, Dr. Ida. Now, you are also serving as the executive director of your nonprofit organization, which is Center of Self-Esteem, whose mission is to end the abuse of children and women, as well as providing support for three orphanages in Africa. Your organization helps women and children deal with issues of abuse, emotional trauma, and physical and sexual abuse abuse and helping them also to find healing self-love and empowerment. Tell us about uh, this nonprofit organization, Center of Self-Esteem, how it got started, uh, how long it's been going, and and uh, I'm really excited about learning about the support for the three orphanages in Africa. I think that's fantastic. So share with our listeners some more about your organization. Yeah, well, this, all of this got started because I was in an abusive marriage, and I thought, how could this happen to me? I thought, you know, I had a bachelor's, I had a master's, I was working to become a licensed managing family therapist, and I also was a registered nurse. I thought, if this could happen to me, it could happen to anyone. Mm-hmm. So I started teaching self-esteem classes to all the women in the, in the domestic violence um, uh, shelters. I started doing anger management because I was very angry. You know, I was really wanting to hurt my husband. You know, that's why I left him because I was thinking about hurting him. Mm -hmm. And so I was angry. So we have a lot of anger and abuse. And so I did anger management classes for women. And and then I started doing some stuff with children. You know, I was a foster mother, started working with children who were sexually molested, who was physically abused. And also I started doing counseling for children. And I did... did, um, had a, a rice of pastors. I did rice of pastors class for the children. 
a self-esteem and a management class for the children. I did a um, a pageant. I had a self-esteem pageant every year where we would focus on the self-esteem, the self-worth, and all the. I had 14. I created 14 categories of high self-esteem, and we would have our um, our pageant are based around that. And I got mentors for the children. Uh, to work with them. So I've done that for the past 26 years, and now I'm focusing my attention more on working with children in Africa. So I'm still working with children, doing work for children here in the States, but I visit Africa at least every other, at least every other, every two years. And there's an office I have, it's a way to a children's daycare center. In fact, I'd always wanted to go to Africa, but I just never got myself there. So in 2009, I went over there and some way to and met this lady who has an orphanage, and so I'm sending her money to, uh, so, you know, to support the kids there. And when I went to Ghana in 2000, it's a 2011, yeah, I went to Ghana in 2011, then I met uh, the Oso uh, orphanage there, and they've been in business since, I think it's 1938 or 40, and they take in children from birth up and uh, keep them there to 21 or 22. And so I, whenever I have money, I give them, support them. And I want to go um, probably next year to Uganda because there's an, an orphanage there that works with children living with AIDS, and I want to go there and support them as well. So my passion is with children, helping children. And so the work that I do, um, my new workshops that I do on loving yourself, I want to do that for women because God told me that what I've done for the children, I need to start doing for the adults. So I'm doing not as much for the children here in the States. I can do some of that work with the adults that I did for the children. And then I have my two orphans in Africa that I'm supporting, and I want to support another. So part of the money that I get from my workshops, that I do live workshops each month, and my journey to self-love and journey to loving yourself workshops I do every month, part of those proceeds go to support, send money to those uh, orphans that I'm supporting in Africa. Fantastic, Dr. Ida. Now you do, as you mentioned, provide live workshops. You also Uh provide retreats and you do one-on-one coaching as well as the classes. Uh How can people find out more about you and what you have to offer? They can go to my my website, www.journeytoselflove.com and the work that I do with children is www.idagreen.com and on the uh, the, on that website they can make a donation to the nonprofit they choose to and also on the www.journeytoselflove they can get a free ebook on that website they can sign up for a complimentary coaching session. They just have to, you know, put in one dollar to reserve their spot and let me know they're gonna uh, keep that a commitment. But I really would invite them if they're in San Diego to attend these uh, live workshops. I do retreats once a year, so my next retreat that's coming up will be in the fall, probably like in September. I'll be doing a retreat. Uh, in the fall here in San Diego. And if anyone is interested in me doing a retreat in their city and they get a group of people together, I will come there and do that. I'm also getting ready to start doing some tele-summits and some webinars on um, on the on my website, uh, you know, to help people to get, do, do some healing work. And I'm also offering what I call angel blessing. And I'm going to be putting a little link on my website where people can call in and get an angel blessing or get a, a spiritual blessing. And there's a little uh, a small fee for you to do that. And they can go on my website and purchase that. But I have the angel blessing that will be on my website within the next month. And they can go and get the angel blessing or get the clairvoyant uh, reading, intuitive clearing or energy process. And all those things are available on my website. Outstanding, Dr. Ida. Thank you so much for joining us this evening and sharing such great insight on how we can take back our power, have more love in our lives, and just make 2016 and beyond beautiful, loving, and more connected with others. Thank you so much. Thank you. And just one last thing. My phone number is 619-262-9951 if they need to call. 
Thank you so much. So Transpersonal Radio listeners, if you resonated with what Dr. Ida had to say and share this evening, make sure you do go to her websites, check out her nonprofits, check out her workshops, her retreats. She has some wonderful coaching sessions. Take advantage of the free ebook and really look into what she has to offer because they can tell you this is a woman who has lived, experienced, and is here to share love and really healing individuals the community, the planet. So take time to check out what she's doing. I will make sure to put the links on my show notes so that you can visit her websites and get more information. And until next week, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Trans Transpersonal Radio. If you'd like to suggest a future future topic or be a guest, visit transpersonalradio.com. Call the hotline at 619-800-6057 or, or like our page, facebook.com slash transpersonalradio.